Everybody wants to know, how did you start the body shop? One of the big tragedies of businesses is they lose their history. Um, it's, it's usually new people come in and they say the past is the past, we don't want to do it, we want to reinvent you. But there is something amazing in the storytelling of where things began, how things began, and what the thinking is. And while I'm alive, I thought to myself, I want to own this narrative. I don't want anybody coming in and putting into my voice or my, or my head what they think I should be doing so, or had done. So I, I've claimed this story. I've written the books, I'm doing the videos. This is the story of the body shop for the first 30 years. It was a series of brilliant accidents and it was a series of great, great having, having no money and finding the creative genius in saying, well, you're back against a wall like a Roman death and saying, how do you survive? If I had have had a shed load of money, I would have gone and if I had business education, if I had gone to business school, I would never be here. I was born in Littlehampton. I was an outsider. I was a, the daughter of economic immigrants, Italians had a work ethic beyond anything. My mum was left a widow when I was 10. We worked for the five o'clock in the morning in a cafe that we had to get the fisherman's breakfast. We closed at night later than anybody else. So for most immigrant kids, the way they got out of that was to either go into a profession like teaching or being a secretary and so on and so forth. Um, so I trained as a teacher. I won a scholarship to study in Israel and that was my first lesson in community when I worked in a kibbutz. Being with a community that are, are attached to the land taught me that more than anything, community supports each other, better than the nation, better than governments, they support each other. And when you're grounded in the community, you're protected. So that was really my very first stab at understanding the power of community. I then came back and I worked for the United Nations in Geneva. And I had no qualifications at all, I was just a teacher. But I got there through bullshitting. I got there by saying, you know, shorthand, mm, I've got longhand in memory. Typing, well, mm, well, that's a matter of a hit and a miss in the use of a rubber, but I'm a great organizer, I'm a great planner, I'm a great networker. So my job was to organize conferences on women's rights and so on and so forth. But what I did as I networked, so when I left two, three years later, I then went to all the countries that I had connections with. So I spent three months in the Polynesian Islands, the Indian Ocean Islands, Mauritius, La Reunion. I went through Australia, then into Africa, and came back, I think I was in my mid-twenties then. D.H. Lawrence once said that you can fall in love with somebody even before you meet them if people speak well of you. And my mum used to read all my letters, hand them over to a man who used to come into a club at uh, Gordon, and I travelled the same places that Gordon had travelled, uh, been to some of the same cities, almost lived in the same houses. And by the time we met, I was ready for a child. He was ready to give me one. We worked, we worked, we worked. We had a hotel, uh, we had a cafe, um, and then he was getting bored with that and he wanted to travel by horse from Buenos Aires to New York. And I had this idea of the body shop there. So I went to the bank manager for a measly 4,000 pound loan and did everything wrong. I came in with my kids and had a Bob Dylan t-shirt and had my jeans and I had this Italian brio. I've got this great idea and it's going to be a body shop and it's going to sell natural ingredients. And of course he said no. Uh, and so Gordon came the next week and he gave Gordon the money and Gordon helped me open up this little shop in Kensington Gardens in Brighton which was jammed between two funeral parlours. And they sent a solicitor's letter to, for me to cease and desist because twice a day the coffins would pass and um, they thought it was disrespectful to passing a shop called The Body Shop. So being the person I was, I anonymously rang up the local newspaper and said I'm being intimidated by mafia undertakers. I have a shop called The Body Shop which Brighton thought it was its first sex shop and my husband is traveling across the world so they had three stories. I learned how to tell stories to the press. Avocado uh, lotions, lettuce lotions, herb extracts, coconut oil. Um, our shampoos are detergent free. They're based on a coconut oil derivative, which means there's no harsh chemicals in them. For years there was no advertising, no marketing department. It was all about storytelling. 
getting in and getting you know, messages in the media because we were interesting. So the shop opened up, we painted it green, it was the only colour that covered the damp patches. And if they want to bring the containers back, they get them refilled and we don't charge again for refills. If you strip it all away, good environmental behaviour is, is good housekeeping. It's usually your frugal. And my mum used to say when she used to come into the shop, oh, it's just like in my house in the Second World War. We refilled everything, reused everything, recycled everything. And that's exactly where you have no resources, i.e. I had no money. So everything was reused. We had 25 products, that was all. But we put them in five sizes, so it looked like 100 plus projects. The bottles were the easiest, ubiquitous bottles you could buy from any boot supply anywhere. They were affectionately called the urine sample bottles, because when you did your urine samples, it's what you peed in. They were called Boston Round, classic, iconic shape, and we used those for years and years and years, and still use that shape. And also, because I had no money, I was doing a lot of guerrilla tactics. So where I parked my car, i take my strawberry essence, fragrance, the oils, and I'd drip it all down the road so people would follow with their noses this strawberry trail. Um, so that got them in. The first thing that strikes you about the body shop is the smell. It's sweet, pungent and earthy. We were different. We had opinions, the products were interesting. There was um, degreasant shampoo that I wouldn't have put on my radiator now. It was, it was bizarre. It shouldn't have survived. It honestly God shouldn't have survived. My ambition was to survive while Gordon was traveling because when he came back after the two years, we were going to emigrate to Australia and buy a pineapple plantation. That was our aim. It was no more so it's like treading water while he was away to survive. And I remember my only financial directive from Gordon was you've got to take 300 pounds a week. That will pay for the rent, that will pay for the overheads, that will pay for the new products you have to have made, and so on and so forth. So if I closed the shop on a Saturday night and I had made, let's say, £190, I would put all those products into gift baskets, log baskets, and knock on the doors and sell them. So I was the original body shop at home consultant. I do talks, I do talk in scout halls. I was out there talking to anybody about it. Then I have friends who said, oh, why don't you open up somewhere else? We can open up, we can open up in, you know, wherever we wanted to. I had no money to open another shop. And so I found a guy who was the boyfriend of one of the, my friends who was helping me in the shop. And he had a garage down the road. And I said, oh, come on, Ian, do you want to help? You know, do you want to put some money into opening up my second little shop in Chichester, which was 10 miles the other side of where I lived? He says, yeah, I'll do that if you give me half the company. I thought, fine, you can have half. I'm going in a year's time with Gordon. You know, the guy is, you know, the guy is just doing very well, let me say. So he, he gave me the money when nobody else, family, friends, bank wouldn't lend me any more money. And he's reaping the benefits of it now. Gordon came back after a year and a half and he said, well, you know, let's see how we can raise money by not going to the bank, by just accepting people saying, oh, look, I want a body shop and we make our money by not charging them a fee, but you know, making money by selling them the products, which they then retailed. He saw the potential of the growth then because we hadn't even heard of the word franchising, but we had no money whatsoever. But people were sort of knocking on the door and saying, oh, you can do this, I'd like to do this. So we, a friend, Adria, had a shop in Bognor. Another friend had a shop in Hove. It was really a collective of friends doing it, and all we were making our money from was selling the product to them. So it was, it was so loosely connected. There was no structure, there was no branding. There was, that even word wasn't even invented then. The way we taught, I've chose our franchisees was one, we were so thankful in the early days, so thankful that anybody was interested in buying any of our products and for whatever reason. So it was mostly, oh, so you've got a car out there and you want to load up some products, sure, you can go, and you've got a cupboard in Belgium somewhere, fine. So it was so loose. And then when we started getting a bit more professional and we realised there was a word called franchising and there was an association called franchising. So we then said, well, we have to make sure that these people that we were having a relationship with, they were never going to be an obstacle for some of the things that we wanted to proselytise on. So we were looking for people who were like us. We didn't want business people, we wanted teachers, we wanted activists. 
kids. We wanted, you know, partners working together. That's what we cared about. To their amazement, that little shop turned out to be an immediate success. When he had four stores, I said, Grief, how many of these things do you want? And he said, well, we'll just see how far it goes. And I think it was, that's, that's, what we're gonna, that's what we're still doing. When we were well advanced into the franchise model, we, we gave them a test called the Marcel Proust questionnaire. And that was the question, like, how, do you, how would you like to die? And what is your favorite color? And what is, you know, I mean, all these bizarre philosophical questions that we thought more relevant than asking your, you know, your financial interests. And we asked them, what will you do in the community? What do you passionate, what would you get up and march on? The annual franchise meeting was major because that was styled in a way where it wasn't just um, telling you about new products or telling about the financial update. We used music, we had games. It was fantastic. They were more like rah-rah religious revival meetings than they were about sitting down duly writing notes about your turnover, as it was. So I think those, those work really well. Everything changed when we were invited to go onto the unlisted securities market, which was the baby of the stock market then, and we had to get our act in order. We had to you know, get our financial act. We had to find people whose skills that we didn't have. We were in our early 40s then, and we suddenly realized that we, our measurement had always been of success, had always been how many people were employing. Oh, going to bed, hey, we're employing 50 today. You know, that was a measurement of success. Suddenly it was all thrown away, and the measurement of, a, of success was money. The guys who took us out of the stock market took us to all these posh clubs, and we came back to Littlehampton in our, in our little old comma van, and we thought, we don't want to be like the big businesses. We want to do things differently. There was no time for reflection, no time for thinking. When you went on the stock market, the dilemma was you consistently had to perform to one very, very uh, simple measure, profit and loss. Very fascistic because it, it didn't bring in any other ways. It wasn't profit and loss, including environmental concerns, including human rights. It was just one measure. And we always tried to change that. And I remember when we opened up our soap factory, we were selling some 15 million bars of soap then, and we were having them made in Turkey. And we looked at the working conditions there and we said, you know, no way, Jose, let's open up our perfect soap factory and build it, you know, our way in Glasgow, which was then, you know, one of, in the, a place called Easterhouse, which was one of the worst housing communities in Western Europe. And let's make it the state of the art. Let's make it the best working conditions, the best pay. Let's have the best daycare facilities. Everything that we could do the best, like we were doing down in our campus in Littlehampton. And let's put 25% of the profits back into the community. You would have thought, you know, the financial press would have you know, put a halo and polished it. Criticism was, you're stealing money from the shareholders' pockets, to which I replied, up your bum. Just up your bum. Both Gordon and I look back and say the biggest mistake we ever made was going public. We probably would not have gone into the malls of America. We probably would have stayed more idiosyncratic. We probably would have stayed much more, you know, as political as we wanted to be. We would have learnt the, our, our own way that to be a small giant was fantastic. You don't have to be big. This notion that growth is the only answer. And we would have, I think, through experience, have challenged that. The body shop tries to do good, it succeeds at doing well, very well. A new store opens on average every 48 hours. With almost half a billion dollars in sales, the company's become a cover story in the business press. It's being hailed as a new age answer to the greed is great 80s, a new concept of capitalism that began as a new concept in cosmetics. We just did what we thought was the right proper thing to do and we learned from from peers and from people whose opinions we respected. Women need to know how other women from every walk of life are shaping social, political and economic trends. We were starting to hear about other progressive businesses around the world who were thinking exactly the same way we were thinking, who were doing activists, who were doing human rights stuff, whether it was anti-war stuff or whatever it was. We were learning from them, we were learning about their business models, we were learning about how they dealt with their community or their workforce. We were learning how to bring a sense of humor into the workforce. You know, we just, a sense of laissez-majest, and so that was enormously beneficial to us. The 
hard bit was how do you communicate when this hugely growing thing, how do you keep intimate in your communications? How do you keep belly to belly? How do you not make it so you open up and pick up a phone and you've got a bloody voicemail? How do you make it so you can still know the, the grandkids' names and the grandparents' names and you walk around the headquarters and you can still know the names of somebody? And consistently, I was asked to do things that no other CEO was asked to do. I wanted to get up at five and I wanted to travel with the delivery with the trucks and see what it was like delivering products to our shops and what the conditions that that, that was for our employees in the shops. You know, otherwise it would be somebody telling me that this is what's going on without me really experiencing it for myself. I think the Quakers during their heyday had said it all and done it all and there were some experiments being done in with cooperatives. We like the cooperative movement in this country, we like different models, Scandinavian business practices we liked, so we're studying a lot of them. Patagonia on the west coast of America who did great sporting stuff and he would be, you know, let my people surf. All his staff were allowed to surf whenever they wanted to. Then there was Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's, you know, who, who, you know, for him, he had this notion of nobody can have seven times more than the basic wage of the basic worker. What we're learning at Ben and Jerry's is that there's a spiritual aspect to business, just as there is to the lives of individuals. And uh, as you help others, you're helped in return. And as your business helps the community, the community supports your business. It's, it's really kind of a beautiful thing, the way it works. We weren't being impressed by the top Fortune 500. In fact, we found them probably the most boring. We were so impressed by social businesses that were doing things and working at the organizational behavior in a different way. Fascinating we were. We were jealous if we hadn't have thought of it first. You know, so when Rover came up with the love program where every one of their members had, or their employees had, a hundred pounds to travel uh, to help them gain, you know, for the helping of their jobs, we said, we can do this better, we can give that money, but it's nothing to do with training, it's to do with just developing your sense of skills of, you know, art and craft and language. We always looked to see who was doing the best. Our child development centre it wasn't because we sat down and think we should do this. I would, did a talk at Patagonia in Ventura in California and uh, Yves Chouinard, the owner, said, you know, don't call your daycare center, you know, a creche. Call it a child development center. So I learned about my daycare center or child development center from him when I visited and gave talks at Ben and Jerry's. He showed me he was had the biggest tourism place in the whole of Vermont. Oh my God, I can do that set up a tour of routes, you know, had 170,000 people would come and see how we made our products, education facilities, our recycling, how we packaged. It was sort of a campus, and I used to think to myself, if you've got a carnival energy, and everything was about carnival, then you'll have a sort of a carnival feel, and people were so excited to come to work because it wasn't boring. And what a happy group of workers we see here. I didn't want to be besmirched by, you know, the way businesses was talking, thinking, and the language it was using, and the behavior it was, that was happening. I didn't want any part of that. I said, yes, I can run a business. I can run a profitable business. I can open up 150 shops a year, and I can still fight for human rights. I can still give thanks to the community who gave us our wealth, and do volunteering in every shop, every person in our company. Yes, and we did that. You know, I felt we'd proven it. We did it the way the Quakers did it. We used to say to our employees, listen, you'll have the best pay in the area, you have the best facilities, you have the love program, you have the child development centre, we're going to be campaigning, this is our nature. If you don't like it, just don't interrupt it. People used to say the negative things were, oh, this is a cult. But it's a cult if the leader stays in a leadership role and doesn't bring people up ahead of them. And it wasn't that. We were always looking for the people with the red dot who, were, who was going to shape the company into, you know, uh, something that it wasn't. We loved that. But you have to be authentic. Reputation is everything. Reputation, reputation, reputation. So if I was dilly-dallying, I wouldn't have any standard in the people I was employing. We needed to raise £330,000. Now, 53% of that came from our own charity shops here in Kosovo, and the other money was raised by the Body Shop Germany, UK Retail, um, Switzerland Body Shop, 
Saudi East, so it was a great body shot effort. Beyond my wildest expectations, I was totally cynical about it because I didn't think we'd get the money or that it would happen. And today, looking at it, it's, and it's fantastic. I'll eat my words. Because we were at that time, we had a human rights department, we had a social action department, we had an environmental auditing department, we had a social responsibility. I mean, we were packed with, with people who were there because of the values of the company. Best wishes and a happy new year from Body Shop Antigua. The average age of the body shop staff was about 27 then. In retailing, employees leave, you know, 85% in a year. Staff were not leaving us. One of our main goals is to make the refill service a real focus in the shops. We aim to make the refill process more efficient. This can only be accomplished with the support and continuing dedication of our shop staff, whose good housekeeping sets the standard for all of us, both consumers and the body shop alike. And then when we got bigger and bigger and we built our own um, plant where we manufactured, we thought, no, we want to be like vertically integrated. We want to take the bottles, make them, blow them, uh, to have our own bottle production plant. And then we were going to put the products in them, which we did, and then we'd recycle them. So when they came back, they either became brushes. I remember we had a comb that said, when I'm next recycled, I want to be a hairbrush. So we made um, travel cones, we made cones for the hair, we made brushes. So we had a project where we were remaking some of the stuff. We'll take the bottle for recycling and then it's five cents off. We had our own windmill and that produced all the energy for the Child Development Centre. We built 40 windmills in Wales to put about a really big percentage of all the energy that we manufacture back into the national grid. And we had the first gas uh, trucks. I mean, they were pretty inspirational then. Motivation was enormous when we said to them, you're in charge now of volunteering in the community. You choose whatever you want. You decide the hours you do. Do it in the work time. We'll pay for it. In the orphanages, we've refurbished them, um, brought in plumbing, heating, and um, electrical supplies. So we've made the, the orphanages habitable for the children. Today is the Golden Challenge, which is actually Senior Citizen Olympics. Body Shop's been preparing, I guess, Oh, for maybe the past six weeks. I leave here and I'm on a natural high. Educating employees on campaigns, not just having a poster in the window and it was stop the burning, it was giving education at the managers' meetings and the employees' meetings, getting people who knew about the subject, who were actually authentic people, learning about it. That was motivational. And also sending our employees around the world, you know, saying, hey, you've done an amazing job. I, we think you deserve to go into a, to India to visit one of our community trade projects. <laughs> Actually, if you bring the camera in here a little bit on my wrist, I'll show you the new, the new wristband design. We had company-wide events. We had Family Day, major. We had uh, This Is Your Life Day. It is going to be magnificent. We designed an entire opera, you know, with all our employees and franchisees. Yeah, we did a lot of that. It, every company should do this. It costs nothing to motivate. It's phenomenal seeing Body Shop Home grow because it's primarily women. Thousands and thousands of women are earning a livelihood where you can either have a part-time job, you're earning three or four you know, hundred quid a month doing what parties you want, or you can make a real profession at it. I went to a friend's in the summer and I was quite impressed with it. Uh, we haven't got a body shopping crew, um, so you, you can't buy it without actually travelling to Hanley or Chester. And it was one way of purchasing things that you wanted. Um, there was no pressure for sales, you just left yourself to decide. And I just quite enjoyed it, so I thought I'd have one. Some of them are earning quarter of a million dollars a year. So, I mean, this is not piddly piddly stuff. I mean, it reminds me of when I started. Normally when I come in here, I've got children with me and haven't got time to ask questions and stand around and look properly. So, going to a party, I found out lots more information and and a, a lot more about different products that you sell. I've done 66 parties now, and I've always had people at the end come up and say, yeah, I'd like some of this I house. Everybody knows Nidorotic.com, so I get mostly body shop home consultants talking to me, and we 
and we have the groups of them. Um, and I used to tell a lot of ideas about the products. So many times in the Body Shop at Home Consultants, I say, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. I'm a woman, I'm a mother and a grandmother, and I can tell you, you can do all of this stuff and you can still have amazing life with your family if you just are smart, if you find your life in a different way. Most entrepreneurs, young people who set up uh, um, enterprises, people like the Body Shop at Home, and I think they're you know, entrepreneurs, they'll have any excuse to work 50 hours a week, 50 hours a day, any excuse, because they get excited by what they're doing, they feel alive by what they're doing. So my advice to them would be, don't think big, start by small steps, think brilliant, think different, think, think, think how different you are from the competition. Network like mad. Women are terrific at networking. They're the ones that pick up the phone and look to see who's doing something better and copy what they're doing better. You don't find that so much in the organizational structures of, of men, but women do that. Thank people consistently when, you know, and go back to feedback on your thinking. And again, I think women are really good at that. Tell stories. I mean, they're the basis of all marketing communications. And if you can have human scaled stories about what you feel about things, how the products, you know, you use them on your mum. I mean, the times I use my mum and all the mistakes she made about what she used the wrong product for, you know, left people with stitches mostly. Um, and just read up about things you know it's really not so much knowledge you need it's just information um, you don't have to be the best at direct selling or the best at business you just have to know enough and I think a lot of this comes through you know through experiences I never ever ever stopped and said oh my god if only I had been to business school I never is that because when I go and I teach in business schools and I love some of the you know some of the things I'm hearing and the, the academics around it and the, the sense of authority. But in the end, it's such traditional thinking. And I think nowadays you've got to come up with products and services and ideas that are just out the box. I mean, who would have thought 30 years ago? 30 years ago, I didn't have a fa you know, I didn't know anything about an iPod. I didn't know anything about the web. I mean, this, is, this change is enormous. So business schools for me aren't really doing the thing. They're encouraging people to think exactly like this, you know, the system, how the system is to be to be better and more polished. If you work in an organisation, uh, to be more polished in the status quo. But entrepreneurs, as I said, are crazy. There's very, very little real research done on women's style management. Still to this day, you get few universities or business schools that discuss uh, management style of females or the management style of men. And men men's are very hierarchical. I don't know too much about business in any I form. hated the idea that women had to be male impersonators, that we had to have the language of men, we had to look like men, we had to have the pinstripe suit. Thank you, I'm honoured, I'm privileged, I'm so thankful I don't have to wear those daft hats. I always irritated, and I was always with this element of being funny, you know. I had all these people, these uh, financial directors and financial institutions which were selling our shares, and I remember going into the board meeting once and said, right, this year I've decided we won't grow at all. We're all just going to have so much fun. Just, you know, just childlike things. I got a hell of a lot of criticism for selling the company to L'Oreal. This looks like you're selling out. You're an activist. Was this acquisition really a part of your long-term vision? I never had a vision. It wasn't part of my long-term vision, but I'm so excited, so excited that this, on the 30th anniversary of The Body Shop, this partnership, and I, I see it truly as a partnership, is happening. The campaigning, the being maverick, changing the rules of business, it's all there protected. It's not going to change, that's part of our DNA. But having L'Oreal come in and say, we like you, we like your ethics, we want to be part of you, we want you to teach us things, it's a gift. To have your thinking become mainstream, going into the belly of the beast, being like a Trojan horse and changing from within or advising from within, I think it's brilliant, brilliant. I come from a working class background. I'm an, I'm an immigrant, I made money, but I still come from a really simple dirt thinking, which is, it's obscene to die rich. That's it, just that. It is not for me to sit on so that when I die, I'm, you know, I'm worth 250 million quid. So 
my whole route in the next 10 years of my life or 20 years of my life, whatever I've got left, is finding really intelligent ways of how I can access the money I have and start donating it.